Antonio Ho, and welcome to Stan Energy Man, coming to you long distance from North Kona, Hawaii. In fact, if you notice in the background of my picture, I've got uh, a helmet. Um, I'm broadcasting today from Blue Planet Research, which is in Puvava in North Kona, Hawaii. And they actually run a uh, moon habitat for NASA and International Space Station folks. And uh, this, the room I'm using is the one that they built uh, custom helmets for the spacesuits in. And that's uh, a really cool place. So thanks to Blue Planet and Paul Pontio for letting me use uh, his room to broadcast from and his, his uh, broadband to, to broadcast with. Today's show, we've got uh, a guest for a change. I haven't had a guest on for almost a month now, getting used to the new studio setup and everything. But a, a good friend of mine uh, from the Big Island also, Dave Deleuze, uh, he's been a big uh, time businessman in Hilo particularly, but on the whole island of uh, the Big Island of Hawaii for many, many, many years. His whole family has uh, been in business, including the automotive business. And he happens to be uh, a Toyota dealer distributorship here on the Big Island. And um, I wanted to talk to him a little bit about the trials and tribulations of bringing in new kinds of vehicles, like Toyota brought in the Prius, and now they're, they're uh, starting off with fuel cell vehicles, the Toyota Mirai. And so we're going to talk a little bit with Dave about what he has to do to set up if he ever wants to get these vehicles here and some of the stumbling blocks and some of the things that the government has to do and some of the things that uh, he'd have to actually fork over money to get started if he wants to venture into new technology. So Dave, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being on, especially short notice. I appreciate it. Hey, um, why don't you give the folks a little bit of background um, of, of your your participation, especially on the automotive side? Um, well, you, you know, I, I, I so so a couple things. Uh, one is that um, uh, my interest in, in in the discussion of uh, alternative energy, especially transportation, came about with my. Um, uh, participation on the County of Hawaii Mayor's Advisory Energy uh, Committee uh, a couple years back and looking to see and understand how we become self-sufficient. And the irony of it is that you were on the counterpart of that not knowing what was going on. So um, two things. One is that because we're an auto dealer, uh, we get access to a tremendous amount of insight to what's going on. And I think, uh, if I recall, Stan, that the uh, was it about a year ago that you were at the grand opening of the Surfco, uh, their first uh, uh, hydrogen station? Right. Um, yeah, when Sur I was actually with uh, Surfco the whole way um, as they broke ground, as they built the thing. I'd go and check on it every once in a while. And then when they finally had the grand opening and the governor did the keynote remarks, yep, I was there. And that was right. a really exciting time because that was the first commercial hydrogen station in the state of Hawaii. And it uh, it's on Oahu where they had some vehicles. And in fact, I think prior to that, maybe as much as five or six years earlier, uh, my first introduction was with General Motors and they looking at Oahu on using uh, Hawaii Gas's uh, distribution system to actually do stations and um, uh, using the pipelines um, it's my understanding that hydrogen is lighter than the natural gas, and so it floats to the top. And, Much lighter. And, and, and they were looking to try to have Oahu as one of their test sites. And unfortunately, uh, it, General Motors at that time and, and even today has elected to go more electric, although that's a misnomer too uh, because essentially a hydrogen vehicle um, is, is an electric car. <laughs> And, and 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 really, one of the things that um, uh, credit to you and working with the ledge, you got that change for us. Yeah, finally, and this, this last session, they finally changed that. So they are including all hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles are included in all electric vehicle legislation now. Parking, uh, HOV lane, all those things apply to fuel cell vehicles now. So, so as part of that conversation and moving forward, um, I was able to meet a gentleman by the name of Peter Matlock, who uh, at that time and still is associated with the Joint Energy Fire Energy Lab uh, in um, Northern California. And although their um, 
project has been looking uh, using biofuels. Uh, one of the challenges with biofuels is the amount of BTU energy it takes to produce, which is one of the other things that um, you um, have given me some insight to and which in reality has been one of the most difficult scenarios in getting us off the fossil fuel uh, narcotics uh, uh, hit that we have as a country and a world. Um, you know, when it takes to produce a one BTU unit of, of energy, um, biofuels are one of the worst converters. And in fact, uh, when you look at the fossil fuel imprint that it takes to produce a, um, a one unit of BTUs, that's one of the challenges we have, which, which by the way is the other reason hydrogen excites me over a pure electric is because <clears throat> the batteries that are used in electric vehicles uh, are probably more detrimental to the environment than, than the fossil fuel emittents, which, which unfortunately, you know, uh, I don't think most people understand that, that context of it. Now, hydrogen, on the other hand, essentially, um, when it's burnt, it, it, it literally turns into to water. <laughs> I, I mean, there's no, there's no emissions. Um, and in fact, one of the things that, that we've been working on, and so have you, is understanding the use of curtailed energy to produce hydrogen, uh, which my understanding, talking to Richard Ha, that might become more of a reality uh, with the advent of more interest in geothermal. Yeah, I think uh, Richard's working on that. And actually, Paul Pontio, Mitch Ewan, and I are working uh, feverishly to get uh, the Helion bus system start to convert over to hydrogen fuel cell buses and um, some other projects, maybe rental cars and things like that. So there's a lot going on on the big island in hydrogen, but you know, you were, you've been around to, to witness the Prius coming up on board and kind of the growing pains that comes along with bringing a new technology into your industry and into your, into your dealerships. How much, you know, in terms of, you know, training for the mechanics and parts and things like that that now you have to bring in, you know, what are some of the challenges that you face when you, when you have to bring in new technology or, or you're going to bring in new technology? So, so I think one of the, the unfortunate scenarios during the first generation Prius, um, the misnomer was that you got into an accident. Uh, one is that the emergency personnel uh, would not or would have a problem cutting you out or if you needed the jaws of life. Uh, one was the electrocution, one was the unstability of the, the batteries. Um, you know, all of those things were there and, and so there was a great effort that was made to, to train first responders in that regard. Uh, also from the perspective of the technician, um, this was a totally different uh, drivetrain that they have to learn and understand. Um, so I, I think that learning curve in the first generation of the Prius was uh, a little iffy, but I, I think to Toyota's credit, they, they put a lot of effort in being able to qualm those uh, questions, and then they were able to quickly adapt to the second generation, which became much more acceptable because it didn't look like an oddball car like the first generation Prius did. Uh, not to mention that the versatility of the second generation and the ability for it on the diagnostic side became much, much easier. So Toyota supported us tremendously in training our people. Um, we have been really fortunate. The car has been very reliable. Um, but putting that aside, the complexity, I think, was more of a misunderstanding of the technology and not having it... Uh, um, you know, uh, I guess adaptive. It's, it's almost when, you know, for example, fuel injection when it first came out. Well, technically, fuel injection has been around since the early 1900s. Well, I don't know. Excuse me, in the 1930s, and it didn't resurface un until the, the, the 70s. And and that was like foreign to a lot of uh, technicians. But uh, one of the things I can say with with the new Prius and of course the Prius Prime is that along with the battery technology, although Toyota has elected um, not to go to NICADs yet um, because they feel that it's 
the current battery system is more reliable, yeah. that there's been high receptivity. Um, and and the other thing which I don't really understand how Toyota has done it is the price point. Uh, the Prius price point is, is extremely affordable uh, for that vehicle uh, type. Yeah, there, you know, in Hawaii, on Oahu, there are, I don't know, tens of thousands of Priuses running around. My neighbor has one. A lot of folks have them, uh, and they really love them. And and so I think the the industry, or at least the automotive uh, press, wasn't really positive on electric vehicles to begin with, and the Prius in particular. And they were basically writing the uh, obituary for the Prius before the thing even rolled out. And then, lo and behold, Toyota really got it out there, and it's turned out to be a very popular car. Are you hoping that the same thing will happen with uh, Mariah, the fuel cell vehicle? You know, that that's actually what's been my promise. In fact, we've been working with Surfco, and, and their biggest challenge, of course, in, in getting it to be more distributed outside, outside of Oahu, uh, one, of course, is the technical um, uh, the technicians' the capacity to be able to service it, but even more so is the availability, availability of fuel. And, you know, one of the challenges which you have worked on um, is to get more continuity between the manufacturers on the, I'm, I'm going to say this incorrectly, but I do believe each manufacturer has a different degree of uh, fuel quality uh, that they need to, to have their vehicles run on. Although my understanding as of the Hyundai and uh, the Kia Souls coming online, not the Soul, but Kia, that there's more moving towards more of a standardization in regards to the, uh, the fuel quality and the, the production of fuel? Yeah, what's been happening is... Uh Toyota and the early early adopters on the hydrogen fuel cell technology have held a really uh, tough line on the purity of the hydrogen, and that's actually driven some of the price point issues. Uh, keeping the hydrogen at 99, we call it five nines, 99999 percent pure is number one. It's really hard to measure that much, uh, let alone certify it. And Toyota is very picky uh, about that certification. What we found is now a lot of the cars they've been selling in California are reaching the end of their lease period, and uh, people are selling them and buying used Mir Mirais, and then they go to whatever station they want and fill whatever they want, and the, the vehicles are responding just fine to any kind of hydrogen that goes in there, um, as long as it's reasonably pure. And... Um, just for your information, uh, a friend of mine is going to probably bring 10 or 11 Mirais, used Mirais, to the Big Island here this year, we're hoping. And so you'll have a bunch of people driving Toyota Mirais around that um, that will be refueling at Paul Fazio's place, or we may even stand up some independent station. Uh, so we may have some on the island before Toyota sent you new ones. Well, you know, it's interesting that Hawaii um, was the uh, one of two. Um, uh, California, of course, was the first market, and Hawaii was picked as the second to introduce the Mirai. And and so it it seems from from all data that that I've looked at that that the state of Hawaii is generally speaking in regards to its its uh, they they tend to be early adopters of this type of technology uh, now. That's not saying that uh, it's, it's, it's public policy that drives this. <laughs> I think it's the consciousness of the people that are here that are wanting this. And, and a big part of it, I, I got to take hats off to Hank and his people of really pushing this concept of being, you know, uh, uh, in 2045, we, we, we'd be non-dependent on fossil fuels. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the, the one thing that, that amazes me uh, with Toyota in regards to hydrogen, and, and by the way, one of the things that also I, I think that it is a misnomer is hydrogen is very adaptive in, in transformation. So, for example, in class, in, in buses and, and, and in class three vehicles, 
Uh, one of the things that impresses me that you can do, you can do a parallel system, but you can actually have it to be a, a, a generator too. And, sure. and, and so, you know, this is one of the things that I don't know that policymakers really totally understand the capacity. We're, we're in the middle of nowhere, right? The most isolated archipelago in the world. I mean, it's just a matter of when a major disaster will occur. Well, we're kind of in one at the moment now. And, and one of the things with having these systems in place, especially these larger parallel systems, is, is they actually can co-gen a, a, an emergency facility. So they have to make a triage uh, a hospital in the middle of a field. And these systems could potentially be those generators. Well, I got, I got good news for you. Mitch Ewan, the three buses that he's ginning up for um, the Heleon bus, the county bus company, or the county bus um, um, service, they're all set up to generate power to uh, sites like you're talking about. So that, that's no longer a dream. Um, we had one of our vehicles manufactured that way for the Air Force, and Mitch decided to do the same thing with the same technology because it's the same platforms on the three county buses that are going to come to the big island. So it's, it's headed this way. You know, we're going to take a quick break here and be back in 60 seconds with more talking Toyota and sustainable transportation with Dave Deleuze from the big island. Kamori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. I feature a wide range of amazing guests who share valuable insights about how going beyond the lines leads to success in everything you do in life. I'm looking forward to you joining me every Monday at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man coming to you live and direct from North Kona, Hawaii. And uh, we're talking to Mr. Dave Deleuze. Uh, he's over in Hilo, actually, so we're two separate locations uh, trying to Pay attention to all the quarantine rules with the coronavirus stuff. Uh, I am still drinking Corona beer, by the way, and I haven't caught anything. So I would I would encourage all of you to cut Corona some slack and drink some of their beer so they, they don't go bankrupt. You know, we have enough uh, economic issues going on with this virus. So support your local brewery. Um, but Dave, we're talking about, um, you know, there's some challenges when you get a new vehicle like the Prius or you, you get uh, the new Mirai. And, you know, Hawaii is actually um, not only a, an early adopter for these sustainable transportations, like uh, the plug-in electrics, they all started in Hawaii, too. We, we had, uh, that was part of the HCAT thing uh, before I was uh, involved with HCAT. But um, the one thing that we don't have that a lot of the mainland states have is that ZEV, the Zero Emission Vehicle, uh, designation where they do carbon trading and things like that. Hawaii decided not to become a dev state, so it's been a real handicap for us to get um, the dealerships to bring the vehicles in because they don't get any kind of a credit for bringing in those vehicles in a non dev state like Hawaii. In California, they get offset, so if they want to bring in their luxury vehicles, they have to bring in so many uh, fuel efficient and clean energy vehicles. and that's why California is kind of taking off that and the amount of money California dumps into the program. So far, we've been botched by two things. We're not a Zev state, and the legislature doesn't give us any money to put the stations out there, which boggles my mind when the county can spend $10 billion on a rail program that only services a small percentage of our, our population. Uh, they can't afford to build a few stations and help uh, dealerships like you out with new, new vehicles. So, but from your perspective and from your end, 
you know, what are some of the things you have to consider when you get a new technology vehicle on board? You know, so um, it, it actually predates uh, the uh, the EV Rav Four. We, we've uh, so you know it's only available in California and um, one other state right now. Um, and we looked at bringing that in. And so one of the challenges of that was that um, you know we weren't going to be able to have the necessary support as far as getting parts and. Um, tech support, uh, only because the, the model was not available in the state. Now, the Mirai, on the other hand, is a totally different deal. Because the Mirai is in-state, um, Surfco has just limited the ability for the Mirai to be sold outside of Oahu because of, primarily from my understanding, it's more of the availability of fuel. So, you know, it's it's my understanding, Mitch, Mitch is very, very close of getting his plant up and running. And so, it, it seems to me that I, I think it's a, is it the third quarter of this year is when they anticipate having uh, production capacity to be able to at least uh, take care of the uh, Kelly on buses. Yeah, he's he's uh, really anxious to get it online. The, the only thing they've been working on that's holding them back is their fire suppression system. Um, they've they've had it on, installed and everything. And it's the kind that meets the uh, local code requirements that they're looking for. Uh, Unfortunately, there's so much corrosion in the environment. They're right down at Nelha near the ocean. Right. And on days like today, when you have a lot of surf pounding against that coastline, the salt spray wreaks havoc on a lot of the electrical components. And the fire suppression system was one of the corrosion um, victims. So they've had to re reinstall the system, and he's waiting for the recertification. So. Uh, it's all fire suppression. The, the station's up. It's been producing. It's ready to go. We're just waiting for the go-ahead from the, the county and the state uh, to get it going. So, Stan, you, you brought up a very interesting question, uh, uh, perspective. It, it is the misnomer of the, the Zeppelin and, and, and uh, what hydrogen was uh, in the people's mind of, of what, what that fuel is about, which, by the way, is, is totally a, a bad rep for hydrogen. <laughs> but... But, but putting that aside, going back to your question, I, I think what's going to happen is what happened um, about eight years, maybe not quite, uh, there were some early, uh, uh, Hawaii Electric Light Company on the Big Island actually converted a bunch of Priuses to um, all electric. They did it on their own. And um, I, I think what, what's going to happen here is, is the same thing, is... Because we have the ability, although it may not necessarily be what uh, Toyota would like, we'll probably have access and resources to be able to get support. So although um, we're not technically a, a, a certified Mirai dealer, I think once the vehicles are on island, it, that's going to change the uh, composition of, of how that's looked at. That's good news, Dave, because... Uh I and by the like way, I'm, I'm, only, I'm only surmising now. I'm not saying they will. <laughs> I know. We wouldn't want you to make a promise you couldn't keep. So. Well, that's that's my sister. She's in charge of the dealership. She'd probably shoot me. But 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 again, you know, based on some of the things I've been involved with, um, it, 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 it 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 I think it will become um, an opportunity. Uh, for Toyota to be able to expand the market in regards to the receptivity. I know that there has been at least five inquiries that, that I've received of people wanting and interested in the Mirai, but until they, the used ones have been coming uh, online, uh, they were not able to get new ones to be shipped here. Okay. Well, you know, you brought up your sister, and I don't want to throw a, a, some flowers at you. You know, People don't, may, may think that, well, we're talking to about a dealership on the Big Island in the middle of the Pacific, and so what? But your dealership won a national award, um, not from Toyota, but from that was from an independent... Uh, yes, yes. My sister, uh, Jackie, who uh, runs our dealerships, uh, was nominated um, to be a, a Time Allied Dealer uh, of the Year award in um, Las Vegas. That's 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 big stuff across the whole the whole northern North America and Hawaii and 
I'm not sure how far that that uh, reach went, but that's a, you know, that's a big deal for a, a dealership like yours. Yes, we've been very blessed. And she's done a great job. Yeah. And plus, I see more Toyota uh, Tacomas and Tundras and stuff driving on the on the <laughs> the highways over here on the Big Island than practically anything else. Doesn't does uh, Tacoma sell more than any other vehicle in the state? Uh, on this island, for sure, um, but it is it is the number one um, sub. I mean, compact truck uh, in the state, um, oh. which um, is um, you know we've been very fortunate. And up until this last model change, which was in 2017, uh, it's become even more popular. So, without giving away classified information, when is it going to make a Tacoma on fuel cell run on fuel cell? You know, I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, I'm thinking, I, I'm hoping that, you know, our um, where this is going to probably move towards, is, and I'm trying to get my good friend, and he's yours as well, at uh, HE, uh, at HECO, to help to drive this policy and initiative on probably starting with the utility. And, right. um, and and he has been very receptive. Um, so you know, we we probably have to when you're when he's on island next time, Stan. We got to you and I corral him and see where we can get him interested in in some type of collaboration. That's a that's a deal. You know, I'm over here an awful lot nowadays, so I'll I'm be glad. To and he does come home. Talk. He does come home. He lives on the Big Island. He doesn't want to live on Oahu, so that's good news. I can't say I blame him. I'm uh, I grew up in Oahu, and I want to move to the Big Island. So. <laughs> All right, well, we're coming up on the end of our uh, 30 minutes here, Dave, and I want to thank you again for uh, especially short notice, and I know you had a late night last night with a bunch of cranky uh, um, sh shareholders or, or stakeholders <laughs> that I'm, I'm one of. Um, so thanks for uh, putting up with uh, us late notice show and being on stand and that, but uh, keep on, on pushing. I know you do a lot behind the scenes to get sustainable transportation and renewable energy on the grid. Uh, in the state here. So I thank you for that effort and I appreciate all the help that you give Paul and Mitch and I uh, when it comes to working with the legislature and those folks. My pleasure. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. All right. So until next week, uh, aloha, and we'll uh, catch you from Oahu next week, uh, hopefully coronavirus-free. So remember, keep drinking that beer. <laughs>